my name is Christina Arias and I'm here at Crane Center, San Francisco, and I'm very honored today to have Dr. Min Jun here. Um, this is a very special show or interview and well, we're going to be talking about robotic peritoneal vaginoplasty. Did I, did I say it right? Yes, yeah, perfect. Okay. So, well, um, Dr. Min Jin is a gender genital affirming surgeon who trained at four different academic centers. He is very well uh, educated, professional uh, surgeon. And well, doctor, thank you for thank thank you for ha thanks for having us here. How are you doing today? Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh... Uh, you know, me and the rest of the training center to participate in this. Well, Dr. Min Jin, he has had a very long professional um, education in, well, I don't know, how many, um, how many surgeries have you performed? How many, well, sex reassignment surgeries have you performed? Um, well, it's, it spans many institutions uh, at... NYU, we did 87 genitoplasties, I'm sorry, vaginoplasties. Uh, so this is not including phalloplasties or meridioplasties, um, but just feminizing 87. Um, since I joined Crane Practice, uh, Crane Center, before I started doing my own vaginoplasties, we probably did somewhere around 30, uh, maybe even more. And on my own, I've done somewhere around 40 uh, since I started doing surgery back in February, which was about eight months ago. So um, let's start talking about like the specifically the robotic uh, peritoneal vaginoplasty. This is probably a surgery that not many people have heard before, especially in the trans community. So what is exactly the robotic uh, peritoneal vaginoplasty? Sure. Uh, the peritoneum is the inside lining of the abdomen. It covers everything in there. You can think of it like wallpaper for your belly. Uh, so it covers the abdominal wall. It covers all of the organs. Its job is to be a non-stick surface so that your organs don't stick together. Rather, they'll slide past each other. Uh, and so there's a lot of this stuff uh, and it covers literally everything. Um, to help it in its mission to be a non-stick surface, it is slightly wet and slippery. So it makes for good material to make vagina out of. Um, robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty can be thought of as having two components. There's the inside stuff, and then there's the outside stuff. The outside stuff is basically a penile inversion vaginoplasty. That said, you know, the finer details of that here break very greatly from one surgeon to the next. Um, we create the outside portion of the vaginal canal with the genital tissue. And then the inside hack is all created using uh, peritoneum. I know there are different um, sex reassignment surgery. Mm -hmm. So what are the other two? Just to mention, we're not gonna focus today on those other other two type of surgeries, mm -hmm. but can we mention those other two? Um, well, I think you're, you're pointing towards penile inversion vaginoplasty, which is probably the most widely performed. Uh, there's colon vaginoplasty, um, everything pretty much falls into those three categories at this point. Okay. So, um, can we talk a little bit about the, the, his, the, I don't know, the, the story of this surgery, like how, how everything started and how was, um, who were the patients who initially were getting, uh, peritoneal vaginoplasty? Uh, this is actually a very old idea. So in 1933, a gynecologist, a Russian gynecologist named M.I. Casido, uh, did the first peritoneal vaginoplasty for girls born with partial or completely absent vagina in a condition called myelodysplastic Kusterhauser syndrome. Um, fast forward to the 60s and 70s, his protege Davidoff. Uh, did more, developed the technique, and uh, actually wrote about it. So that's why it's known as the Davidoff vaginoplasty. Uh, it continued to be done for my aerobic uh, patients. So these are cis female patients we're talking about. 
Uh, in 2016, it was Dr. Lee Zhao at NYU, uh, one of my mentors, uh, and Dr. Rachel Bubon Langner. Uh, in combination, they formed the first peritoneal flap uh, feminizing vaginoplasty uh, with the robot. Uh, and that is where I got my training, and that's how we got to today. So initially, it's a, I mean, it's unbelievable, but it's amazing that this procedure in the beginning was um, performed in cisgender woman. And now, like um, you and pro, I, I, I read on the Crane Center that it was you and another surgeon from uh, New York City. You are the two surgeons who are performing these surgeries in transgender patients. Trans female. Uh, well, Dr. Lee Zell was the first one to actually do the robotic uh, feminizing vaginal plasty. Um, and since then, he's trained three fellows who are doing robotic peritoneal flat vaginal plasty, me being one of them. Um, there are several other people, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of interest around this uh, technique. So many other physicians have come by, uh, you know, wanting to observe it. And so, uh, and so, yeah, hopefully many more patients can benefit because more, you know, physicians are being trained in this technique. Well, that's amazing. I like this is a fantastic job and I know that you enjoy like um, you're helping a lot of lives. And thank you so much for everything you're doing in the community. Uh, one of the things that we were receiving on on Instagram, it was um, what do I need to qualify for 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 this surgery? Like. What are the requirements for this surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it, it's the same requirements for any kind of you know, uh, gender affirming bottom surgery. Uh, so there are the WPATH requirements, of course, uh, which requires, um, I, mean, I won't belabor the fact, but you know, you definitely need those letters. Those are the major hurdles uh, amongst other requirements that WPATH lays out. Um, you know, you have to do hair removal in the general region before surgery. Um, really, that, that's pretty much it as far as preoperative preparation in the months leading up to surgery. Okay, perfect. Um, so, how, how can patients uh, prepare for this surgery? Like, are there other, like, pre-op requirements from the patient? Like, besides, like, uh, I don't know, like the hormone replacement therapy, how long do I have to be on, on hormones? Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, we can kind of go into those requirements. Uh, you had to have been on hormones continuously for uh, one year preceding surgery. Uh, you also have to have a hormone provider writing a letter of recommendation saying as much. Uh, you have to have lived as your identified gender for at least a year continuously before surgery. Uh, and you have to have two mental health professionals, one being a doctorate level, uh, writing letters of recommendation, again, saying as much. Um, and those are basically the WPAP requirements. Another question that um, one of the persons in our audience were, were, were doing, it was like, why do the peritoneum provide self-lubrication? Sure. There's a lot of questions about lubrication when it comes to peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. Um, it is true that the peritoneum is a secretory tissue. Like I said, peritoneum is a non-stick surface and to accomplish its mission, it needs to be slightly wet so that it can be slippery and non-stick. Um, that said, it doesn't provide so much that it's going to be enough for intercourse. You're likely going to need lubrication for that. Um, while it might provide some moisture, it is not, uh, it doesn't react to, uh, you know, sexual stimulation. Uh, so you're not producing more when you're aroused, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so while it might provide some moisture, as far as lubrication for intercourse, I think that's generally a falsehood. You should expect to need to use lubrication. Wow, that's very interesting. Hopefully you're um, you're getting that. And also another of the questions is like, does it make a difference if the patient um, hasn't been circumcised? Circumcision 
It's always nice to be uncircumcised because there's more material for surgery. In general, reconstructive surgery, you're trying to build something out of something else. So you're really beholden to how much starting material that you have. And if you're uncircumcised, there's going to be more material there, right? Uh, and so it is, it is definitely helpful at times to have that extra tissue. That said, it, being circumcised isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially with peritoneal flat vaginoplasty, because, you know, again, one of the challenges is, well, we have to line this vaginal canal with something, right? Uh, and you know, penile skin has always been it. But I have peritoneum that I'm going to line your vaginal canal with. So that means there's kind of a relative excess of shaft skin. So while it is important to have as much penile skin as possible in a penile inversion vaginoplasty, it is less important in the peritoneal flat vaginoplasty to have that skin because I can rely on peritoneum. And th this is another this is another question from our audience on Instagram. Is like, is it true that I will have to wear a pad now because I'm getting like a lot of lubrication, mm -hmm. like after surgery? Is this true? Like, do your patients have to wear like some type of pad or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in the it'll change. That answer changes over the course of time. So right after surgery, the way that the vaginal canal is constructed, there are a lot of nooks and crannies uh, and, and fluid will kind of hang out in those spaces and they'll make its way out over the course of the day. Uh, and like we established before, the uh, peritoneum is a secretory tissue. So there is being moisture produced, although it's really not all that much. Um, In the beginning will be the time where you have the most uh, need for a pad. Over the course of many months and maybe up to a year, uh, your vaginal canal will start to take its final shape and it'll become smoother. There are fewer nooks and crannies for fluid to hang out in. And so you'll notice that there's a decrease in how much discharge you have. Uh, and uh, many girls, most girls I would say, don't need any pads eventually. But at the beginning, pretty much everyone does. So this is a question, this is a more personal question. What, 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 what inspire you to perform these kind of surgeries? Like to train you f to perform these surgeries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area you know, 80s and 90s, and, uh, you know, my parents didn't let me watch too much TV, but they always let me watch the 10 o'clock news. Uh, and so 80s and 90s were, I mean, every night you would hear about, you know, the age of the uh, you were, you know, being in San Francisco, there was always talk about the LGB, there was no T community, uh, and, you know, hate crime was something that I heard of on the regular as a child, so I'm just a product of my environment. It just seemed like all of that was wrong, right? But I'm a kid at that point, I didn't think anything of it. If you fast forward to uh, residency, so I'm a urology resident now, right? Um, most people, even surgeons, haven't really even heard of transgender surgery. They don't know any transgender surgeons. Uh, I was really into reconstructive urology. Uh, that's just what I thought was cool. And so I, I read a lot about it and I came across in journals, uh, transgender surgeries. And honestly, I thought it was really cool. Uh, it's, it's basically the Super Bowl of reconstructive surgery. It's the most technically demanding. Um, and it was just really interesting. And it also seemed like there was very little of it being done and there was a lot of improvement to be made. So if I, just as a surgeon, could make a dent anywhere, uh, this would be a good place to try to make that dent. Um, and when it came time to kind of choose a, a profession for life, you know, I call it the puberty, <laughs> um, the, the, the puberty time for, for urology residents, you know, I just, all of these thoughts kind of came together. I'd love to go back home. I'd love to serve the community that raised me. I'd love to be able to do these crazy surgeries 
And I'd love to improve these crazy surgeries because there's not really that much as far as uh, research and advancement. Uh, and so at the end, it just became a very, very easy choice for me. Yeah, I want to dedicate my life to this. I think it'll change lives for the positive. And, you know, I kind of want to feel good about myself too. And so, uh, yeah, it's a dream come true. All of it has come true. Well, thank you so much. I know that you are like, you are doing an amazing job and you are changing so many lives and you're helping, uh, especially in the, in the trans community, you're helping so many trans women um, to achieve their dreams. And well, this requires a lot of discipline, years and years and years of preparation. And um, well, thank you so much. You're, you're, you're amazing. Uh, you're like, you're like a magician. <laughs> No, it, it gives my life a lot of meaning too. So honestly, thank thank you all at just as much. Well, we have another question. Um, we know that there is three different, um, like three different uh, peritoneal vaginoplasty. The I think is the flap, like peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. That is the surgery that you are performing. There is the the colon is colon colon vaginoplasty and the other one that I don't remember. But can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, it's like categories within categories. So let's go to the top. penile inversion vaginoplasty, which is the one that's been done the most. Some people call it the gold standard. I don't know if I completely agree with that, but it's definitely been the most. I no one can disagree with that. Uh, there's colon vaginoplasty uh, or enteric vaginoplasty. So you're using some part of your intestines uh, to create a vaginal canal. Uh, and then there's peritoneal vaginoplasty. Peritoneum has been a big buzzword lately um, and, and people throw it around, but there's nuance to it. So there's peritoneal graft vaginoplasty. Uh, that's where you take peritoneum literally outside the body form it onto a, a, a vaginal mold and uh, and and you you insert it. <laughs> um, there's peritoneal pull through. Uh, that is the David L. vaginal plasty uh, that gynecologists do. Honestly, there's no real good source of exactly how that is being performed. So it's a little bit of a mystery as far as the technical aspects of it. Um, but I am almost certain that it is nowhere near as uh, extensive as peritoneal flat vaginoplasty which is what i'm doing uh and and i think that's one of the great areas that we can improve uh as far as the scientific or the surgical community goes um one of the reasons why I love my time at NYU was because when I got there and I saw all the amazing work that they're doing, all that innovative work that, that's not being done anywhere else, um, I wanted to share that with the world. And I asked Dr. Zhao and Dr. Dumont Langer, can I take video of everything that's going on over here and we'll publish it so that everyone can see and everyone can learn? Uh, they love that idea. They were totally on board because to them, it's like to me, if there is something that can help patients, let's help as many patients as possible. Um, and so, so we put our technique out there, uh, and there's less confusion as far as all right, one peritoneal flat vaginoplasty is, is different from another peritoneal vaginoplasty, and now we know that there's all the great to make fun. No, that's true. And also there's information everywhere. Like you can find videos on YouTube, you can find articles, you can find forums, but you know, that's also creating a lot of confusion in the, in, in the people. And so many people, especially like trans kids who are very young, uh, who are in the beginning in their transition, probably they don't know what it's true, what it's not. And well, this is one of the reasons we are creating this video. Um, Crane Center San Francisco and Dr. June and all the all the crew, all the team from Crane Center San Francisco, they are committed with the community. And well, they believe that they can provide the best information and they can help to change lives. And everything starts providing the real information and good information. So, um, 
Let's say that um, that this patient had the peritoneal budget, flap vaginoplasty, and later in life, this patient has like cancer prostate, or this mm -hmm. patient um, requires a prostate surgery. What's gonna happen? Sure. Uh, it really depends exactly what they need because not all prostate cancer patients need prostate surgery. Um, and there are more than one reason to have prostate surgery. Let's just go through some real life examples of, of how things might go down. So let's say you have vaginoplasty and uh, despite being on hormones, your prostate has grown because now you're 60 years old and you're having trouble peeing. So that's a very common problem. Um, well, there are minimally invasive techniques that have been developed even in the last just 10 years uh, that don't require removal of prostate tissue. Uh, you can just kind of move the tissue off to the side. Uh, that shouldn't affect the vaginal canal at all. Whereas, uh, you, know, if, if you, you know, if you were to get a transurethral resection of the prostate where you core out the middle of the prostate, that could cause problems. You might actually get a fistula with that procedure. So uh, that's one example. You'll probably be okay. Your urologist just needs to choose the correct procedure for you. Uh, as far as something like prostate cancer, uh, thankfully there's more than one way to treat prostate cancer. Uh, surgery is one of them, but you could also have radiation. Um, and, and in fact, uh, while your vaginal canal probably will suffer from the effects of radiation, it might actually be helpful to have that vaginal canal there um, because one of the problems with getting radiation to the prostate is that the rectum is, is injured in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have a vagina, you can actually put some protection in there mm. and, and protect the rectum from the radiation. So, um, yeah, the bottom line is there are ways to get around these issues. Uh, they are relatively new issues and, you know, we as urologists are just going to have to keep our brain a little bit more as far as how to go about it. Well, that's amazing. I mean, this is a question that I never thought about it, but I mean, it can happen. Yeah. Um, so this is another question. I think is this is very important because this, this situation is something that it's happening to not many, but I know that some patients who already had the vaginoplasty. Um, the question is, if I already had the vaginoplasty in my vaginal canal, closed up because I stopped dilating, what is going to prevent, what is going to prevent me from going to the same, going to the same road if I have like peritoneal vaginoplasty? That's a great question. It's something that we worry about too. You know, if you've had vaginal stenosis once, what's stopping you from having vaginal canal again? And so you have to change something so that you don't have the same outcome. Um, one of the barriers of, of, of dilating, well, number one, you have to figure out why the patient stopped dilating. Was it because there was a lot of pain? Was it because you had problems with your pelvic floor? Um, you know, was it just that you were lazy? <laughs> um, you know, and, and her life got in the way, whatever it might be. Uh, it, you know, one, there shouldn't be any victim blaming. Mean, there should be all right, then what's the solution to that? And oftentimes it boils down to the pelvic floor. I would say that's the number one cause, pelvic floor dysfunction. So physical therapy comes in very, very handy there. Um, you know, because you need to be able to relax your pelvic floor muscles in order to dilate effectively. Uh, and if, if you've had surgery there, there's a lot of scar tissue there. So dilating is gonna be even harder. You really need good control of your pelvic floor muscles. And so that's why every single one of my uh, revision patients, uh, I, will, I will insist that you have pelvic floor physical therapy because we don't want the exact same outcome again. I need to make things easier for you after this revision surgery. Well, and also I want to clarify because you were talking about uh, vaginal stenosis. Mm -hmm. Did I say it right? Vaginal stenosis, yes. 
So what is this? And do this happen only to trans women or women that have had a vaginoplasty? It depends how you define it, but it all does kind of boil down to that pelvic floor musculature. So let's talk about that for a second. What is it? Uh, the pelvic floor muscles are shaped like a bowl and they're on the bottom of your uh, pelvis and they support all of your pelvic organs and your abdominal organs as well. They're a big group of muscles that is very important. And during vaginoplasty, you literally have to put a hole through it, uh, you know, so that your vaginal canal can go across it. Uh, and cis women have that hole too. It just was there since development. Uh, and so if you have, these muscles are always on, I, I like to say. Mm -hmm. uh, they have muscle tone, so to speak. They're very similar to your back muscles. You know, we're sitting upright like this without thinking about it because these muscles, very large muscles, are always working and we don't have to think about it. Um, the only problem is these always on muscles are actually hard to turn off, right? That's why we get tension headaches sometimes because everything's so tight that you, you get headaches. Uh, and so it can be really unnatural to relax these much muscles, which is exactly what you need to do in order to dilate. You know, think of the bicep muscle. That's a completely different muscle. Always off until you turn it on, right? Okay. So the pelvic floor is always on until you turn it off, which can be very difficult. Um, and so that is a, a tight point in your vaginal canal. And I would say in most patients who had vaginal stenosis, that is where it ends, where the pelvic floor muscles are. So in cis women, you can get this too. Uh, like I said, you can have a lot of stress and a lot of muscle tone, and it's hard to relax those muscles. That can happen with the pelvic floor, and that's called vaginismus. And uh, a lot of uh, cis women actually go to physical therapy to learn how to relax those muscles. So there definitely is some crossover there. I mean, these are things that probably not even cis women knew. And well, I think this is a very important message, especially for all the trans women who are um, trying to get this surgery. And I think hopefully this is going to help them and this is, going, this is going to improve their, their life quality. So we have a couple questions more before we finish this segment. And one of them is... Is peritoneal uh, flap vaginoplasty less risky than uh, penile inversion? Hmm. Um, I think it depends who your surgeon is, really. Um, so let's talk about the single worst thing that can happen. Uh, rectal injury leading to rectovaginal fistula. That's where you're pooping out of your vagina. Uh, you'll probably suffer for months. Uh, you'll probably have at least one more surgery, usually more than that. And you'll probably lose your vaginal canal in the process. So that's a very bad thing uh, to happen. How often does it happen with penile you know, inversion? It varies from one report to the next. In general, it's about 1%. Uh, what about for, uh, you know, robotic peritoneal flat vaginal plastic? There is something that I don't think is kind of known in the general public. When you do penile inversion vaginoplasty, you have to create that space in between your rectum and the urinary system from the outside in, right? And it can kind of get to be a deep, dark space. Uh, and so you want an experienced surgeon who knows where they're going, um, or else you might end up with something like a, a rectal injury. Uh, the robot uh, actually makes things easier because, well, you have a high definition camera and you have these robotic arms that are able to reach deep inside the pelvis. Uh, and so you're able to see things better. Um, it definitely feels safer because of that. We don't actually know yet academically if, if we can say that because we require a lot of data to prove that. But I believe things are trending that way. And again, at least from where I sit as a surgeon, it seems like uh, a safer uh, way to do things. That said, in general, vaginoplasty is is definitely safe. One of the worst things that can happen happens only one percent of the time. I mean, 
That's not zero, <laughs> but it's not that bad. And what about after surgery? Do I still, like how long after surgery do I, do I still need to dilate and douche? As far as dilation goes, uh, it's front loaded. So what I mean by that is in the beginning, you're doing more dilation. It's extra important at that point in time. So I have patients starting uh, at four times a day for the first six weeks, then three times a day for the next six weeks. And then after that, I tell them, I don't know. Every, everyone's different, you know? Uh, some people scar a lot and have a lot of contractures, so they might need to dilate uh, more often and longer. Uh, and then there are the delicate little flowers, like I said, <laughs> as I like to say, uh, you will need to dilate less because you, you just don't form that many scars. So there is this spectrum. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I tell patients, hey, we're going to figure this out together. It's going to be a moving target. You'll do less over time, but you do need to be prepared to dilate to some degree for the rest of your life as long as you want to work.